The rest of us, let's take out our Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. We're going to complete the message on prayer that I started two weeks ago. Ephesians chapter 6, turn to verse, uh, we'll look at verse 18. That's where we'll start. Verses 18 through 20. And this part of the series, we've been focusing on how to stand against the powers of darkness by appropriating God's armor. It's available to every believer. The Holy Spirit lives in each of us. He indwells us. He's given us His Word that instructs us and really unfolds all that God has given us. But each individual believer is our responsibility to appropriate it to every day. Just as you uh, prepared yourself to come to church today and you dressed yourself, we have to consciously dress ourselves, so to speak, with the armor of God. You have to know what it is, you have to know how to use it, and you have to choose then to use each piece of the armor. So today, what we're looking at is this matter of prayer is not one of the pieces of the armor, it is how one of the ways, one of the means that we appropriate it, that we put it on, that we use the armor. Prayer is the means then for appropriating and exercising the armor. So we saw last week that our prayers can arm ourselves and arm one another. So as I intercede for you, I help to arm you. Prayer we saw last week was a discipleship tool. That as you pray some of these prayers uh, for one another and for people you're trying to influence for the Lord, uh, some of the prayers that Paul prayed in chapter 1, chapter 3, then as we pray these prayers for one another, we are helping to disciple one another. Even though we might not be in the same room with them, we can be praying and it helps us to develop a disciple's mindset and helps to arm them for the fight. In the same way, we need to be asking others to be praying for us that we would be armed for the fight. So let's look at the scripture here. Verse 18 says, Praying always with all prayer, meaning every kind of prayer, and supplication in the Spirit, that's specific requests, and watching thereunto with all perseverance. So this is something we're to be doing continually. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So our prayers, our intercessory prayers, are to be prayed for one another. We're upholding each other. Just like uh, you see in the movies and such, uh, if you've been in the military, you understand it firsthand. Uh, if, you, if you're, uh, whether you're in, in, the, in the Army or maybe you're in the, maybe the SWAT team or you're on the, the police force, uh, what happens when they have to go into a place of danger? They say, cover me. And so there's very specific ways. And when you move into a dangerous place, uh, you have to be careful not to... Um, uh, move in such a way that the others behind you either shoot you or can't cover you, right? So those behind are providing support for the point man. And really, that's what each of us are to be doing, praying for each other, covering one another as we go into harm's way. So he says, you need to be praying always with all perseverance for all saints. This is one of our greatest ministries, one to another, is to be praying for one another. But today, what we're going to focus on is seeking the prayers of others. It is not a selfish thing to request prayer for yourself. The Apostle Paul did. He says, be praying always, all prayer and perseverance and supplication for all saints, verse 19, and for me, and for me. So asking prayer for yourself is a critical part of your own spiritual growth. That's why we have the church. We are called 
to be members one of another, dependent on one another. And so it's appropriate, in fact, even a mature response to ask for prayer from one another. That's the sign of a growing, mature Christian. So let's look at how Paul requested prayer for himself so that he could be armed for the fight. And let's draw some specific applications as to how we can follow his example. We've got a runaway. <laughs> okay. He forgot his what? Oh, he forgot his Bible. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> oh. Hopefully he's wanting to be armed for the fight. He forgot his Bible. Hopefully that's the, the issue. All right. So here we go. Um, point number one. Request prayer for your own spiritual armament. He says, pray for me. He's bringing this whole book to a close. And he's been telling believers all that we have in Christ. But he's not saying, hey, you need to do this, and you need to do this, and this is for you, this is for you, this is for you, and I'm on this pedestal. That's not the case. Here he is, the disciple maker, revealing he's still a disciple. And he says, I need your prayers for me. None of us graduate to a place where we don't need the prayers of others. None of us do. So therefore, we ought to follow his example in requesting prayer. Those who ask prayer for themselves are living with an awareness of the reality of the spiritual battle. Those who are not asking prayer for themselves, sometimes it's, um, we are not focused on the spiritual battle at hand where we don't realize the need for prayer sometimes. And so it doesn't even come to our mind to ask for prayer. Maybe we, we resort to worry or we resort to some other aspect of human effort rather than first not just calling upon God but reaching out to someone else and saying, you know what, I need prayer right now. And that's not a burdensome thing. You're, you're not uh, putting a burden on someone that they shouldn't be carrying with you, right? We can be praying for one another. I cannot necessarily carry your burden, but I can help to pray for you and in a sense help to shoulder it or help to strengthen you under the burden. And we ought to be doing that one for another. So asking for prayer for yourself is not a mark of weakness, it's a mark of maturity. Uh, if we back up in verse 18, based upon what, um, based on the context of this, um, this verb, praying always, this really command, we have three different things that we can we uh, that can qualify uh, the way we ask people to be praying. First, ask others to be praying for you continuously or regularly. This should be our regular practice. Why? Because he says, "Pray always." Verse 18. Pray always for all saints and for me. So he's requesting that you be praying always, not just for saints. Be praying consistently, continuously for me. That's not selfish to, to ask for that. Secondly, ask others to be praying for you as directed by the Spirit. He said, I want you praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. We need to be encouraging one another. You know what? If the Holy Spirit just puts, puts me upon your heart, please be praying for me. I'm going through some situations. Just be sensitive. Um, if the Holy Spirit brings, brings me to mind, please be praying. Third, ask others to be praying for you vigilantly. If the devil is as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, never rests, never sleeps, he just seems the onslaught of evil is relentless, then we as believers need to be relentless in our vigilance, in our prayer one for another. One of the aspects of maturity in general is the aspect of perseverance. Just staying with it. Whether that be athletics, whether that be in work, whether that be in school, whether that be in certainly spiritual endeavors, a mature athlete or uh, someone who's having success, 
in their business or in their career or their field is someone who has persevered and continues. Many battles are, are just won by sheer attrition being the last one standing. And we as Christians then need to be vigilant so we continue to stand because the devil can't take us down, right? He can't force us to stop praying. He cannot force us to sin. He has to deceive us. But still, we have the truth. We don't have to be deceived. We don't have to give in to his temptations. He doesn't have to knock us off our feet. We can choose to remain standing in prayer one for another. So, request prayer for your own spiritual armament. Ask for others to be praying for you regularly, to be praying by the Spirit, and uh, be praying for you vigilantly, vigilantly, persistently, perseveringly. Second, request prayer for the right words to speak to the lost. Look at verse 19. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me. This word utterance is, we don't use it as much nowadays as, you, as, as maybe they did when this was translated. And you think, utterance, wow, that's, that's what does that mean? Um, in the Greek, this is the simple word logos. In the beginning was the logos, right? Jesus is the living word. But the word logos can refer to both Jesus as well as just a specific word. Jesus is the word sent from God, but in this case, um, he's, the idea is he's asking for the specific words to say. I need the right word. He's seeking the, the right, the specific words to say. Um, when we're witnessing to others, and especially when we're new at this, but Paul was by no means new to being a witness, and yet he's still praying for this. But wh what do we often pray for? Lord, help me, help me to say the right thing. Give me the right words to direct this conversation to the gospel. Give me the right words to um, maybe counteract the false beliefs of this individual to point out lovingly and compassionately that Jesus is the only way. There is such thing as a right and wrong way to declare the gospel. Sometimes we can do so in a very uh, prideful way, sometimes a um, brash way, maybe a, a way that's, that's less than compassionate it's very easy to do. In fact, folks, let me tell you, it is far easier to minister the gospel in the flesh than in the spirit because the flesh is natural. But to declare the gospel compassionately, where it's not... Folks, Christians have turned a witnessing opportunity into a screaming match. That's not... <laughs> that's not the way it's to be done. There's a right and wrong way. And the Apostle Paul is saying, I need the right words. Pray for me that I would have the right words. So Paul is seeing the need that we need God to be with our mouth. Remember the, um, this, the account of Moses and Pharaoh. And God says, I want you to give my message to Pharaoh. And Moses says, I can't speak. I'm afraid. And here he had been trained in all of these ways of the Egyptians. And if any, anyone should have been able to speak well, it would have been him. But when it came to speaking for God, he felt like he couldn't do it. It just shows how our own resources are really so inept when it comes to trying to be a witness and trying to do something on a spiritual level. This is something that's, that's, that needs spiritual empowerment. And God promised him this. Exodus 4, verse 12, I've got it in, in your notes. God said, I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. I will be with your mouth. We need prayer asking God to help us. 
You know, whatever you're passionate about, folks, very passionate about, it's much more easy to speak about it, correct? Uh, because it's your passion. It's what you've thrown so much time into. It's what you believe. And you, you believe it so deeply, and you want others to know it, too. And because you're so passionate, sometimes it can be easy to just rest on your own strength and sometimes try to force the gospel down someone's throat or force someone to agree with a point that you're making. When we're not the convincer, that's the Holy Spirit. And we need to be saying, Lord, please be with my mouth. Please direct what I say. Please keep me from saying something that's going to throw up an, an, un, an unnecessary barrier to the gospel. The gospel itself is offensive. We don't need to be adding to the offense of the gospel. And we have to be so careful. So how do we word this into a prayer? We need to be asking one another, please pray that God will guide my mouth and teach me what to say. This needs to be part of our continuous, continual progress, process. Is this part of your daily life? This needs to be part of our daily pattern because it's something we're to be always doing. This should be a discussion that we're having regularly with those closest to us, with husbands, wives, children, those here in the church. Luke 21, 14 through 15. This is a great counterbalance. Luke 21, 14 to 15, Jesus told the disciples, Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate uh, before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. So there is a possibility of overthinking. I'm the kind of person that... Uh, initially, I, uh, growing up, I hated the phone. Absolutely despised it. I still don't necessarily enjoy it, but now it's a part of life, and so it's, it's, it's a lot easier now. But um, when, I was, when I had to call somebody, uh, especially someone I did not know well, and there was something I needed from them or needed to talk through and needed to work out, um, it was so difficult for me to make that call until I thought through exactly what I was going to say and every potential response. And so I'd overthink it. And so I brought that same hesitancy into my uh, uh, gospel presentation. So I'd be so afraid of what the person was going to say. I I'd think, okay, I have, to, I have to know everything I'm going to say all ahead of time. Then if I say this, but he says that, then what will I say then? And so I, I think through all these different things, so much so, I was paralyzed and I was not growing in my ability to declare the gospel. So while it is true that we need to be asking God to give us the right words and obviously know the specific word that we're trying to communicate, the gospel, and it's good, we need to be constantly studying approaches, knowing how to answer. The Lord says, know how to answer every man. We need to have Question, uh, answers to people's questions as part of growing in our ability to declare the gospel. While that's all true, it is also possible to overthink things and rest then on my, 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 um, my ultimate trust is coming in my own understanding. Well, I can't give it yet. I don't understand perfectly enough. No, that's my ultimate trust is not in how well I understand the gospel. My ultimate trust is the gospel is the power of God and I need to declare what I know of it and let God do the rest. In a sense, it'll always be incomplete because my knowledge is always incomplete. There's no such thing then as a perfect presentation of the gospel, but there is absolutely a spirit-empowered presentation of the gospel. And that's accessible for anyone of any spiritual growth, like the woman at the well. The Lord speaks to her, and she realizes he's the Messiah, and she runs back to the city, being minutes old in the Lord, and she's declaring, come see. Is, he, is not this the Christ? 
He told me everything ever I did. And she's just declaring what she knows in the power of the Spirit. So the Lord says, on the other hand, pray that God would be with our mouth. But on the other hand, don't overthink it. Don't go into all these meditations of what you're going to answer. And if, he, if this and that and this, he says, at, at, at a certain point, you just need to go in and put your foot out there, take that step, open your mouth, create that opportunity, get that conversation going, and then just speak for me. And I will give you the words to say. So we need to be praying then. How do we, how do we phrase this into a prayer request? Please pray that I will not overthink what I should say, but instead speak powerfully. I remember my dad modeled this for me. Um, especially when, when we were older, I remember this very clearly. Uh, when we lived in Wisconsin, we lived in two different parsonages. And I remember my dad took great pains to develop a relationship with the neighbors, and then at some point he would say, okay, family, pray for me. I don't have any visits lined up for tonight. We had a Tuesday night soul winning. Say, I don't have any visits for tonight. I'm going to be going over to so-and-so's house, the goal of sharing the gospel with them. Man, that was a real prayer meeting. We'd be praying for supper. Dad would be excited about it, but he'd also be uh, kind of... Um, a bit fearful as well. And I can remember one time in specific, I was probably in high school, and Dad said, today's the day. Be praying for me. And so we ate supper, and Dad went upstairs to his room. And I went in there, and <laughs> it was awesome. Dad, Dad was literally sprawled out on the bed, just looking up at the ceiling, and I knew he was praying. And he just sprawled out there, I just peeked in there, and it was an awesome sight. And, I've, and I could tell he was very, very nervous because witnessing to neighbors is tough because, as, as you know, I've said it many, many a time, one of the reasons we do these barbecues in the summertime is witnessing to those closest to you, the closest, closer someone is to you, the more you have to lose. And that's why it's more difficult, all right? You don't want to mess up the relationship. So family is the hardest, especially those living in your own house, because it can mess up your, it, not mess up, put it this way, it can bring conflict into your daily life. Um, a, a neighbor is also very similar. It can be bringing conflict. A, a coworker, these are the tough ones. And so there was a bit of fear, because you're not sure how it's going to go. But my dad felt, hey, we, we know them well enough. It's time to pop the question, ask them if they know the Lord. I remember he went over there. We're all praying at home. We're thinking, oh boy, how's this going to go? And I hope dad doesn't say something wrong and ruin our relationship over there because that's our best friend Randy next door. And you know what? He came home that night beaming. He said, I gave the gospel to him. All four, mom, dad, daughter, son, they all knelt down there and prayed and trusted Christ as their savior awesome. Randy is specific. They continue to go to their church uh, after they were uh, saved, but they let uh, their son Randy come to our church uh, pretty consistently, at least for a time there. He was part of our uh, basketball team, our church basketball team. It was fantastic. But what was exciting about that is dad brought our family into it. And Folks, when you ask for prayer one to another, especially folks, mature believers here, all right? Those of you who've known the Lord for a long time. When you ask for prayer for one another and even from younger believers and say, please be praying for me. God has put it on my heart to be talking to this person. So I've got to put a date and time to at least do something and not just leave it up to random chance. I, I, I'm making a plan, and I'm going this day, this time, taking this person out to coffee. I'm making an opportunity. Please be praying for me, because this could go really well, or this could go really bad. I'm really scared, but would you be praying for me? Folks, when you do that, 
what you do is you show younger believers this struggle that, we, that, that they have in trying to be a witness is something we all face. And they're not some sub-level of Christian. We all live here. We all live in the, with the same fears, and we never really outgrow them. We just hopefully learn how to um, counteract or overcome, maybe more efficiently and more, more regularly, hopefully. But those fears never, ever go away. And so when you are asking prayer, you are helping others to step into that moment with you, and you all get to grow together. As Paul pens this letter, he's about to face the greatest opportunity of his Christian ministry. To stand before Nero and defend himself. This is the man who hung prisoners, many times Christians, from a rope, not around their neck, but often around their arms. He'd dip them in tar and light them on fire while they're alive. Talk about a horrible way to die, and they're hanging there on fire, and he'd light his gardens with that, which was, was crazy. The stench of that would be horrible. But this is the kind of man that he was, and the Apostle Paul was preparing himself to stand before him. And while he had to be excited in one sense, we know he was, because he'd always wanted to take the gospel to the very highest levels in Rome. He wanted to give the gospel to the Caesar if he could, but another part of him had to be terrified because it could also go very, very badly and result in extreme bodily harm and torture and pain. And so he is asking then, here he is in prison. And folks, I'm, I'm, I'm so convicted by this. You know what I would be praying if I was sitting in prison about to face Nero? I would be praying for an earthquake like we had with Paul and Silas that shook the prison and allowed my, 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 my chains to fall off so I could get out of there. Start a new Roman church and a Philippian jailer running in saying, what, you know, Roman jailer, what must I do to be saved? He didn't pray for his freedom. He did not pray for uh, his physical protection, which I also would have been doing. I'm about to speak before Nero. Please pray for me. He didn't do that. Not to say that those things are bad. What was his primary focus and should be ours as well? So all those other things should be secondary. His primary focus was this. Be praying for me that I would have the right words when I speak before Nero. Nero. It had to be clearly, clearly at the forefront of his mind. God allows difficult things into our lives that sometimes the very purpose of them is to create a platform for the gospel. And so he doesn't want to remove it. So when we say, Lord, I want freedom from this, the Lord said, I, uh, sometimes I think they're in heaven saying, no, I placed that there. The devil he didn't even have to ask me. I put it there like he did with Job. This was my idea. Have you considered my servant down here in the Joliet area? Um, the Lord does that on, on occasion, to magnify himself through us. And so if we're just fixated on that and we miss on the opportunity of seeing what God could do with it, folks, it is the struggles in life that truly make us you don't learn as much in a victory as you do oftentimes in a challenge. Sometimes those things don't go the way that we plan, but oftentimes those are the ones that, you, that, that learn so much and have so much more to share. And God uses difficult situations to magnify himself, and we need to see it as that. Most certainly the devil's attempting to attack Paul to prevent his testimony. There had to be times in which he was very afraid. Paul recognizes that he's in the midst of an intense spiritual battle and desperately needs the prayers of his brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Fortunately, Paul was not all alone. He did have Epaphras, and he had people who could come and visit him. But he realized, even though he was separated, he needed his brothers and sisters in Christ engaging in the battle with him. So if he needed to be praying for the right words to speak to the lost, so do we. Number three, we need to request prayers for boldness. That I may open my mouth boldly. As I ought to speak. So, second, third here, request prayers for boldness. It's interesting that Paul twice asks for prayer here. For, for boldness, he says it there in verse 19, and he says it again in verse 20. He says, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly. So here he is, the Apostle Paul, with so many gifts, and here he is, an apostle, he's writing scripture. You'd think if anyone would have natural boldness, it'd be Paul, and yet he says, I don't, I need boldness, and he asks for it twice. So if Paul needs to be praying for boldness, you and I do as well. This word for boldness should not be confused with brashness or insensitivity. It literally has the idea of confidence. Boldness is really a byproduct of confidence. If you're confident in the gospel, then you can be bold. You can declare it because you're certain of it. Your certainty is there. Your your faith is in the power of the gospel, not in yourself. Brashness really is showing a lack of confidence in the gospel because you're thinking, you know what, if I don't add something to this, they're not going to accept it. So I'm going to have to put on this brash attitude and really kind of jam it in there so they really get a hold of it. And what that's showing is you, your, your power is in your own ability to persuade through your brashness or through the strength of your personality rather than in the strength of the Lord. Over and over, folks, I have seen this to be the case. The best witnesses are not the most extroverted or those with the most flamboyant personalities. Oftentimes, they're the worst because they talk mile a minute. They show really no interest in the person they're speaking to. It's all about them, and it totally comes across to the person they're trying to lead to Christ. And maybe just through their own coercive personality, sometimes they can even coerce a response, but that person's just doing it simply because it's, it's kind of like judo. This is the quickest way I can get you off my back, so I'll bend if you want me to bend, but I'm out of here. So tell me, what, if there's a, a magic thing to say, I'll say the magic thing, and I'm gone, I'm hitting the door, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm getting rid of you that way. So many times the most flamboyant are also the most deceived as to their true success in sharing the gospel. God can use all types, and if you happen to have that that type of a very strong personality, God can still use you. He might give you a thorn in the flesh, though, like the uh, Apostle Paul, to help you be dependent upon him rather than all your natural skills. But oftentimes, the most powerful are those who would seem to be the least Likely, the witness of a child is so powerful. The witness of someone who seems maybe physically weak, and yet they have this confidence in the the Lord and this boldness. Folks, it's amazing. My my brother Jonathan uh, used to travel in evangelism, and one of the things he would do is he would lead evangelistic teams that would train people in how to share their faith. And so they would actually take people out soul winning and he would teach them so they were learning in a kind of a classroom setting then each day they would go out and actually learn and put into work uh, what they've learned and try to go meet people out and about in the community and one of he said by hands down his best trainers happened to be women who were very very um, introverted he said but when they shared the gospel it was just so obvious that this is not this individual because they, they initiate, initiate the conversation kind of quiet and timid. 
But then if they're given the opportunity to declare the gospel and they begin to, to, to share it, it's like they become so, almost someone different. Or just God is upon them so clearly that they're the ones seeing the most people saved. Not the most dominant, the most, simply the most um, trusting the Lord, just yielding in him. So any one of us can be confident and bold in this way. We find that in the book of Acts, that God did answer this request. Acts chapter 28, verses 30 to 31 tells us that the Apostle Paul was two years in a hired house. So he probably started out in a dungeon, eventually got pulled out of there, was put into house arrest. But to keep him from running away, he was chained to a Roman guard. And that guard was probably changed every 12 to 6, hour, or six to 12 hours. And so he had new people to witness to, but folks being chained, I've never been chained, but I, I imagine there has to be something very psychologically difficult about it. Being chained, whether that be to the wrist or to the ankle, and realize you are a prisoner. And every time you move, you've got that chain on your leg, and you can't go anywhere without literally being chained to another person. And here he's, he's chained and so, folks, he had every reason to feel defeated. He had every, every reason to feel less than who he was in Christ. He had every reason to feel isolated and vulnerable and powerless and certainly not confident. Why should anybody listen to him? His message got him thrown in jail. Folks, my mind would go around so many rabbit holes, I would keep my mouth closed. And I'm sure the devil tried to take him that way, too. Who are you to be speaking boldly? Look at that chain. And yet, everyone that came, whether it be uh, a Jewish person who had uh, heard of him and wanted to ask him more questions, whether it be that Roman guard, Philippians tells us that so many of those guards were being saved that the gospel had gone up through the entire palace. As they'd be released from him, he said it was going through the entire city of Rome. Why? People were coming to him, he was sharing the gospel, and they were taking the gospel with them. He was evangelizing Rome from a prison cell, but it never would have happened if he wasn't bold. And he was not bold because of his own resources. He realized he wouldn't be bold without the prayers of God's people. Folks, when was the last time you prayed for boldness to be a witness? Prayer meetings get very, very real. When we are praying, we come together and we say, okay, please be praying for me. As of this date, I'm taking so-and-so out for coffee. Please be praying for me. I remember... <clears throat> uh, I share this often when I'm preparing our church for the barbecue season. I love this season because prayer meetings get really real. You're about to invite all your neighbors. So we're, if you happen to be a host home, you're saying, please be praying for me. And I love that because you're praying for boldness and give me effectiveness. But then in the follow-up as well, it's so powerful because you find out about needs that you can minister to. Um, the gospel with not every time, but especially as you keep with it, keep sowing seeds year after year, God gives opportunities. I've shared the story before, but it, it, it's, it's, it was such a thrill for me, and I, I hope will be an encouragement. Maybe some of you haven't heard it. I remember a man by the name of Frank, some of you met him, came to our barbecue, and he told me, second year in, this is our second time doing it, he said, you know what? Thank you so much for doing this. Tears coming down his cheeks. He said, this is probably my last barbecue. I said, really? He said, yes, I don't, I don't have much longer to live. And I said, really? I did not know that. And immediately the Lord says, he's top priority number one. You've got to get back to him, and you've got to get back to him soon. Well, I let too much time go by because uh, we had n numerous barbecues we were doing that summer. It wasn't until maybe a month or two later, and I finally I was convicted. I told my wife, I've got to do this. I told the church that Wednesday night prayer meeting, and whoever was there, you remember it. And I said, please be praying for me. This Saturday, I'm going to Frank's house, walking down, the, down the, uh, the, the, the block. Please be praying that I can witness to him. So I got my materials together. I had my Bible. I had, I think, the exchange Bible study as well. 
just in case. It doesn't work for everyone. It, it does work for some. Um, but <clears throat> had my materials together, was walking down that sidewalk, and before I could cross the street to his house, saw his best friend across the street, Frank, uh, uh, Joe, and you have met him too. He's been to our church numerous times. So Joe's in his, in his yard. We've got Frank, who I was planning to visit, but Joe's standing there, and he says, hey, Nathan, so good to see you. He said, hey, can I get you some water? I said, sure. He said, come on in. That's never happened before. It's never happened since. I thought, okay, I had other plans, but the Lord's redirecting me. So we go in. We sit down at his kitchen table with really no agenda. He wasn't going to show me anything or talk to me. So I said, well, the reason I was out today, Joe, is I was going to be, you know, at the barbecue, Frank told me he doesn't have much longer to live. He's like, you're right. He said, it's, it, it's very sad. He's very sick. I said, well, the reason I'm going to talk to him is because I've never shared with him how he could know for sure he's on his way to heaven. How he can have his sins forgiven, have a relationship with God. And he said, oh, he needs to know that. He said, I'm so glad you're going to do that. I said, yeah, that, that, that's actually what I was on my way to do today. And I said, you know, Joe, I've actually never asked you. Is that something that you know for sure if you were to die? That w would you be confident that you'd know that your sins are forgiven? That you'd have a relationship with God? That you'd have a home in heaven? And he said, you know what? Something that my wife and I have wondered for years he said we don't know i said can i just take the, i'm going to take the bible and show you the book of john john chapter three how you can know for sure he said yes i'd love that and in the process of time i shared the gospel with him he understood it he said i want to wait to make that decision until my wife is here she's gone today he said but he said we'll do this again next week but i'm going to walk you over to frank's house right now we walk over to frank's house joe knocks on the door Frank comes to the door. He says, hey, Frank, look, this is Nathan from down the street. Remember he had that barbecue? And hey, he has a message that you need to hear. You better let him in. So Frank's like, come on in. We sit down. And after about two hours, led him uh, to Christ. Come to find out later, another one of the neighbors, uh, Kelly, had witnessed to him numerous times planting seeds. And he had always put up walls. But God gave me the opportunity to... to, to, to reap a harvest that other believers, another um, neighbor down the street, had been planting seeds in, uh, of the gospel in his heart, and I got to reap. Awesome. And then uh, a week or two later, was able to lead Joe and his wife to Christ, and they've been to our church numerous times. Well, folks, it never would have happened if I had waited for them to come knock on my door and say, could you please tell me? Folks, they don't even, they don't know what their need is fully, and they, so they therefore, if, they, if you don't know the question, how can you know the answer, or who has them? And so it is our job then, folks, to put feet to our prayers and take the mystery out of it. It's not mystical. Yes, you do pray for God's leading, but at some point you have to make a plan and follow it. And that is where we are, Jesus pursued you purposefully. How are you purposefully pursuing those around you. The plan of, the, of salvation was made in eternity past in the mind of God, and it was very specific, and it was intricate, and it was awesome. What is your plan to pursue the lost around you? Get that plan and then pray for boldness and confidence to execute it. I cannot promise, folks, every, I've asked for you to be praying for me for boldness, to be able to give the gospel um, many times. And honestly, not every time do we have something so dramatic as that. I'm just giving you an example of something that, it, that is possible. And folks, this needs to be much more a part of the way we pray and when we ask for prayers one for another. And I know as your pastor, I need to be leading the way in this even more. So when we come together for volunteer meeting, I'm asking you, hey, I've got so-and-so I'm following up, following up with, please be praying for boldness. 
And as I do that and lead by example, my goal is then is I lead the way that we also as a church be doing this. So as we're coming together for that volunteer meeting or Wednesday night, we're coming together and we're saying, you know what? God's given me this opportunity with this person at work. I've really been working hard to build that relationship. We've got a strong, uh, f f stable foundation. And now my plan is to, to, to uh, give the gospel. I'm in building this foundation. Now pray for me. We're going out fishing this weekend. We're going to have opportunity one-on-one. -on -one. Be praying for me that I'd have boldness and the word to say. Folks, that's the way I want to see our prayer meetings growing. I'm praying also. I, I pray with my kids before bed. We do pray for some of their friends uh, who need to be saved, but not enough. So if I'm discipling them, then I, I'm just going to be asking them to be praying and developing their own plan. How are you going to reach your neighbors? Not to set myself up on a pedestal at all, but when I was a child, not even a teenager yet, I was leading my first friends to Christ simply because we had people in our church. That was the way that, that they lived. That was the way my, way, way my dad lived. The Lord's convicted me. I need to be leading my kids that way and equipping them. I had learned the Romans road using the little draw, drawing your hand, tracing your hand, and then writing the little verses, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 10.13. I memorized those as a 10 or 11, 12-year-old, and I led people to Christ knowing only those in John 3.16, six verses. And folks, this is how we can be growing, and this is how we can be discipling our kids. There's nothing more powerful when you're asking your kids, please be praying for daddy t tonight. We're having so-and-so over for supper. And, you know, we've been doing this off and on for a while, trying to reach out to them. And tonight, we're going to try to give them the gospel. And we need you to be really quiet in the other room. But mommy and daddy are going to try to witness to so-and-so, the neighbors over here. Folks, that kind of prayer is not going to just transform your life. It's not just going to transform your, your children's lives um, God's going to generationally change your family tree. The gospel is transformative, and when you are literally cooperating with it and living it out, and it's part of the way you live, it's transformative. Time is just about gone. Man. Let's try to hurry this up. I, I will let you go quick. Um, <clears throat> prayer for, request prayer for effectiveness. He said that I, may, um, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. This mystery is an expression from the book of Daniel, refers to God's overall work of redemption. It's summed up in the person of Jesus Christ. It's revealed to us now. We call it the gospel. So we ought to regularly request prayers from others to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. If Paul needed, needed prayer to do this, when he was the messenger of the, messenger of the mystery, we need to be praying the same way. So we ought, each of us then are going to spread the gospel. It will be unique to our own gifting, personality, and experiences. So look at the way... Look at your resources. Some of us are going to do really well across a table face to face. Some of us are not going to do well that way, especially for the men in the room. It can be very challenging. Some guys don't like making eye contact in general. Some guys aren't readers. And you're not going to really minister to them across the table that way or across a cup of coffee. Some guys aren't going to do that. They're not going to share coffee with another guy. They just don't do that. So maybe the way you're going to reach that guy is maybe you're good with your hands, maybe you're good with a car, maybe you can use that hobby to bring someone into your life, maybe find someone with a similar hobby and develop a relationship and just as you are shoulder to shoulder, maybe fishing, maybe whatever you're doing, you're shoulder to shoulder, you're both doing what you're doing, but you're talking about the Lord. God's going to give you men, if you're looking for those shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder opportunities, God's going to give them to you. I'm a teacher. I'm very comfortable face-to-face -face and sitting down and with people. That's kind of the, the way I like to do it. 
But you don't have to do it that way. Look at the way God has gifted you and use it. The important thing is take what's in your hand and use it. Take what you have and use it. How are you using your gifts, your life experiences to resonate with others and pull them in? I'm going to throw this out too. Um, this is, hey, 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 I get to live this one out right now. Hallelujah. <clears throat> um, there is here in this community, uh, and in fact nationwide, something called F3. It is a men's fitness group. It stands for Fitness, Fellowship, Faith. It was started by a believer down in North Carolina, a man from the military. He created this. It's, it's non-denominational. It's not led by a pastor. Um, but it's a loose framework, which, would be, which is men getting together in the mornings, early mornings. In this area, I think Monday through Friday is 5.15 to 6.15. On Saturdays, it's usually 6.30 to 7.30. They just started a new chapter that uses this, this facility. I found out about it because they reached out to me. They said, you're a pastor. You probably know the principal and the, uh, the superintendent. Can you put us in touch? And then can you join us? And what I find out about this group is the guys come initially for weight loss. So it's guys of all ages. All weights, there have been some guys uh, in their 60s, uh, maybe older. Some guys, they're like over 300 pounds. Everybody just does what they can through this exercise thing. But it's very regimented. It's an opportunity to develop leadership, but I see it as an awesome discipleship tool. Six or eight weeks in, you're able to, uh, if you want to, they actually ask you to lead an, a, a, an exercise, and then you get to give a, a brief uh, challenge at the end. And what I found is many of the guys get into it because they have no church. Many of them have a religious background but no church. And so they're, they're hungry for a, for, a, for a tribe, so to speak. So they come to this because they're hungry for that fellowship aspect. They said what, 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 what kind of bit us was the fitness, but what's keeping us here is that fellowship aspect. And then the faith aspect, they're not so into except for maybe as, as far as organized religion is more about serving the community, which is great. But I've found many of them are not believers as far as born-again believers. And it provides a fantastic opportunity. I want you to be praying for me as I go out on Saturdays, developing relationships that by God's grace, I mean, afterwards, the guys love to stand around and talk around coffee 15, 20, 30 minutes on a Saturday. And it's just awesome. 12 guys, all different fitness levels, and the, the, the conversation goes any number of ways. It's fantastic. I would encourage you, there might be one in your area. Um, if you wanted to come and join me on Saturday, uh, Saturdays, let me know. But it's a way to build a, re a relationship. I'm not going to hijack that, and the challenge is only two or three minutes, so it literally has to be something that piques someone's interest, and hopefully will lead to conversations later. But, folks, this is what we need to be doing. Finding something. I love fitness. So, and I have some time on a Saturday morning at 6.30 to 7.30. This is something I'm going to jump into, and it's a way to my boys, at teenagers, are going to be leading other men in a workout and speaking to other men. It's going to be awesome. It's a discipleship tool for me to disciple my boys, and it's a way for me also to be reaching my community. Um, fitness might not be your thing. The goal is find something that is and leverage it for the gospel. You like to work on cars? Do it. Bring someone along to work with you that you know is lost. And uh, maybe if you're not so good at, the, at sharing the gospel, maybe bring someone who also likes to work on cars but is a little better at sharing the gospel than you and see if two of you on one can help to bring that person to Christ. It's a team effort. Five, I just have to say it quickly and then move on. Be praying for a gospel identity. He says, be praying for me that the word would be given to me. I may be, be able to speak my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds. Folks, without seeing yourself as a primary, primary identity is not um, what you do. It's not your stat station in life. It's not whether you're single or married. Your primary identity is a Christian. 
being a Christian. And you have to cultivate that and foster that. It is not just to be a Christian, it's to be a spokesperson for the Lord, ambassador. The only way that you develop that is to be constantly developing the mindset. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though Christ had beseech you by us. We pray you, and Christ said, Be ye reconciled to God. That is our job. Quickly here, number six. We will not do the job if we don't first see ourselves, and that takes daily cultivation. Six, request prayer for perseverance in the face of opposition. And I can't go into any more than that. And seven, pray for a growing awareness of your responsibility to share the gospel that I may speak boldly as I ought. Yes, we ought. Yes, it's a responsibility. So let me ask you this, and I by no means am saying this as me on a, on a, on a, on a um, pedestal. Each one of us needs to ask this question. When was the last time you asked for prayer from another believer to be praying for you for boldness because you're going to be speaking to someone in a specific way, not just necessarily generally, but you say, please pray for me, I'm, I'm going to be speaking to so-and-so. When was the last time we said that? I was in preparation for this message, I mentioned this to my wife. And it was convicting to me that it's been too long since I've asked for that, myself. When was the last time? And if the Apostle Paul is sitting there, possibly facing execution, and he doesn't even pray, he doesn't pray for physical things. Folks, what's the first thing we pray for usually? It's physical. I do not want to diminish it, but the body is going to die, and there's nothing that you and I can do about it. It's going to die. Not that we shouldn't pray for it and care for it. The body's going to die. Jesus came to redeem your soul. And as we pray for one another, are you consumed with their soul? Are you consumed with the soul of your child? With the souls of your neighbors? With the souls of your friends? What grips our heart initially is what we can see, and we see the physical, and our eye affects our heart, but we need to ask for the eye of the Lord that sees deeper than the, the difficulty they may be going through, and sometimes sees that difficulty, Lord, we want to see that difficulty removed. We want to see, but Lord, even more, use this to see them redeemed. So Lord, if you choose not to take them out of that difficulty, use the difficulty to turn their eyes to you and then pursue them. So I've said too much. I've preached at least two messages here. The children's workers need an award today. <clears throat> but let's go ahead and pray. Let's be praying for each other. And let me challenge you. Let's be asking one another, at least one person this week, put yourself on the spot, create a plan, put yourself out of your comfort zone, maybe it's just handing the track, attract some to somebody. Take an opportunity where, you're no, where you know you're going to be crossing paths with an unbeliever and talk to a Christian and say, pray for me, I'm going to hand this track, or I'm going to invite this neighbor to the church, and I'm going to do it on this day at this time, and here I go, or maybe here's a phone call, pray for me, or a text, pray for me, here I go, and then keep in contact with that person and do it, and come back, and if you fail, you pray with each other, and you encourage each other, you strengthen each other, and you go and you do it again. Failure does not mean you stop. Failure means you learn. It's another admission, I'm human. And this is a fight, and this is a struggle, so I'm going to double down, and I'm going to go and do it again. And in perseverance, you mature. But do it, and don't do it alone. There's no superhero Christian. We do it with others. Request prayer this week, very specifically. Let me challenge you with that. You want to ask me, I would love to pray for you. Whoever, choose somebody, specifically one-on-one, -on -one, with a call or a text or something, and let's do it. One person, one per request, one specific action this week. God would be honored in that. And there's going to be growth all the way through it. You can't lose, folks, when you're serving the Lord. You might not see someone saved every time, but you can't lose when you're doing what's right. All right? You're going to grow if you do this.